Oftentimes, we're called upon to perform a second or third machining operation on an existing part. So it's very important that we understand how to properly set that part up, make different locations based on that part's length, diameter, width, etc., so we can get a hole in the right place, machine a slot in the right place. As an example, we're going to take this round cylindrical piece of aluminum tubing. The customer has requested that we find the center of it, drill a hole, in the center of the part, in this dimension, as well as this diameter. Now, a problem comes to mind. Many of you will say, all right, well, we'll just set it in the vise this way and clamp it. Well, two things can arise in this particular application. One, if we tighten the vise too tight, we can simply crush this piece of tubing. But most importantly, we don't have any place to get at to really measure. We could come back off of our master jaw with our edge finder and kiss it this way and then move into the center. But I think a better way to hold this particular part is to simply turn it in the vise this way. All right, this allows us to measure off of an exposed area here as well as on this side. So we've got two uninterrupted areas that we can bring our edge finder against in order to locate the edge and thereby the center of the part for our drilling operation. This particular tool that I'm holding in my hand is called an edge finder. Very important tool for the machinist. These little nubbins that you see on the end are held together in the body by a long extension spring. So as we run it up against the part, it starts running true and then the moment that we hit the part, you're going to see it jump in an offset mode this way, indicating contact. All right, the diameter of our edge finder is 200 thousandths. This is usually a standard. So anytime that you're dealing with an edge finder, run your dial calipers or micrometer over the end to determine the diameter of it. <coughs> As we bring our edge finder up to the part and it makes contact, you'll see the offset kick in. Okay, at that point we've made contact and we can go ahead and adjust our dial whether we're using a digital readout or, in this instance, we're going to go ahead and use the X and Y axis and loosen the dials on the bed in order to perform this operation. So if our part were two inches thick, the center of it would be one inch plus the one hundred thousandths offset that we have in the edge finder. So we would move the part over one inch and one hundred thousandths from our contact point to locate that hole exactly in the center. It'll become a lot easier for you to understand once we show you the actual process. We're going to grasp this in the Albrecht keyless chuck. The body diameter is also three-eighths of an inch in diameter, so we can grab it in a collet. But a drill chuck is the obvious holding method because we're going to follow it up with the center drill. Let's take the dimensions on our part and start to calculate where our center line is going to be. Using the dial calipers, we've got a dimension of one inch, 250 thousandths. So half of that is 625 thousandths plus the 100 thousandths for half the diameter of the edge finder. So from either edge, the amount that we would move the table in the y-axis is 725 thousandths. We'll work one dimension at a time. Watch closely as we show you the offset when using an edge finder. Even though we're not cutting, it's a good idea to put on our safety glasses during this operation. We're going to move the table, advance the quill down to where we can see our edge finder protruding over the lip that we want to contact. Lock the quill down. And very slowly advance the table or the edge finder towards our part. You can see the offset taking place when we come in contact with the part. You want to have a very gentle touch here. You don't want to work it in really quick and break the edge finder or pull it off the spring. Be very gentle and as soon as we see it offset at that point we're going to lock the gib down on the y-axis, we'll loosen the lock ring on the dial, advance the dial to zero, hold it in place with the left hand, and then finger tighten our lock ring. This gives us an accurate setting. Now we'll raise the quill, moving the edge finder out of the way, 
And we'll slowly go back to our dial now, and we're going to advance the table 725 thousandths. Remember, in the X and Y axis, each rotation of the dial is 200 thousandths per revolution. So we've got 200 thousandths, 400 thousandths. Watch our knob. This is a good counter that we can do each time we rotate it. 600 thousandths, 700, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25, stopping on 75. Now it's time to lock the gib down on the y-axis of the machine. We'll turn our machine off. We'll take another dimension as to the diameter of the part. One inch, 740 thousandths. We're going to divide that by two. So that is 870 thousandths plus the 100 thousandths for the edge finder. We're going to advance our table on the x-axis. Bring our edge finder down where it just goes past the center line of the part. Remember, we always have to work off of a diameter or an edge of a part with the edge finder. Now, it's real critical that we don't get the body of the edge finder up against the part because this is going to give us a false reading. We simply want our 200 thousandths diameter lug to be the indicator. So be very careful in the placement of that. Lock our quill down. Turn our machine on, and again, watch for the offset as we come in contact. All right, we can see the offset appear right on the edge here where my fingernail is. We're running flush, there we see the offset. At that point, as soon as we see the offset, we know that we've made contact. We're gonna reach under the table, lock our gib down, locking the table into the x-axis we're going to loosen the lock ring, rotate our dial to zero, lock the lock ring down again, loosen our gib. We're going to go back to the edge finder, We're going to raise the edge finder above the work, and advance our table now. The desired dimension, which is 970 thousandths, 30 thousandths less than five revolutions, okay? So we've got 200, 400, 600, 800 thousandths in four revolutions, 900 thousandths and 70. So we're gonna stop on 30 right at that point, okay? So we've advanced the table in the x-axis we're going to lock our gib down at that point, and now we're ready to center drill our hole. Remove our edge finder, install our center drill, and let's take a minute and talk about center drills in the milling operation. <clears throat> we have different sizes of center drills. This is a double-ended center drill, as most center drills are. Anytime that we're using a keyless chuck, keep in mind that we have a plate that comes down and secures the point on top of the, the center drill. So when we install the center drill in the chuck, we want to bring the chuck in contact with it, push it all the way to the top, and then pull it down, maybe 30, 40 thousandths, so that plate that's coming down on top of the chuck does not dull the top cutting edge of our center drill. That's a mistake a lot of people make. They push the center drill in, they push it all the way to the top of the chuck, and then they really put the pretzel hold on it, tightening it, and it's what happens, that plate's forced down against the top cutting edge and it dulls it, and we've lost a cutting edge on that surface. So with our center drill now, okay, on the center drill, you're gonna see we have the little spot tip here, and we've also got a 60 degree angle here. This is what's gonna guide our secondary drill after we've spotted it. The center drill is a very short, stiff drill, it's used for locating that first hole. It doesn't walk and drift as if we were to use a long conventional drill. So watch closely now as we perform a center drilling operation in the mill. Turn our machine on. Going to bring our drill down in contact with our part. Very gently pull the quill down. Now we're just starting to cut into our 60 degree chamfer. 
We'll go ahead and retract our drill. Okay, you can see now that we've got a nice cone shaped hole that's going to guide that second drill as we come in and bring our hole to size. This is very important that we come down into that bevel, not just come in and spot it on the top. Okay, we're going to use a number seven cobalt drill. When we're worrying about a drill now, it's important that we push it to the top of the chuck where that plate comes down and compresses it, holding it securely. It's only when we use a center drill that we want to retract it just a little bit so we don't damage the point. Okay, we're going to go ahead and adjust our quill handle because we lowered the table. We want to be in the proper position, as we showed you earlier, to pull the quill down and not force it underneath, whereas if our hand slips off, we fall into the cutter or our machine, okay? Go ahead and turn it on very gently, start the drill down. Drill all the way through, retract our drill, hit the handbrake. You can see how fast an Albrecht keyless chuck is. We can drill a lot of holes in a hurry. We're not fumbling around for the chuck key, scraping our knuckles, trying to get the drill out and putting another one in. For production work, the Albrecht keyless chuck is the number one chuck for your milling and drilling operations. All right, so that's one method of finding the center of a part, drilling a hole, using an edge finder. Now, let's take a look at, again, another type of setup and the complications that it may afford in a machining operation. Let's take a look at the use of a secondary vise clamped in our primary vise. This is our little toolmaker's vise that we talked about earlier. We've got a piece of 11L17 bar stock mounted in it, and the customers requested that we cut a 30 degree sloping angle on the end of these parts. Apparently it's some kind of a key slide that he is using in the manufacture of another part, and he needs a precise angle machined on that. So by grasping the part in the vise, we're simply going to set it in our other vise and use what is called an angle block. This is a precision ground block at 30 degrees. We're simply going to set it in underneath the vise jaws here and set our vise on top of it. Okay, Make sure that it sets nice and flat underneath here. It's just a little gauge spacer block is all we're setting it on to dictate the angle of our vise. Okay, just seat our vise with the heel of our hand, go back and loosen it up, check it, make sure everything's fine, give it the final tightening operation. Now we're going to be machining a piece of steel now. Up till now we've been machining aluminum. So we're going to want to adjust the speed and feed rate because we're dealing with a little bit harder material. We also have a lot of material exposed out of the vise. So that's something that we need to keep in mind as well. We want to take some relatively light cuts as we surface across the top of our part. We're going to raise our table up, giving us a good rigid cutter position. You can see that we've choked the cutter up pretty far in the collet. We don't have a lot of exposed cutter protruding down from our collet. It's a half inch diameter collet in steel. Let's go ahead and adjust our speed now to 660 RPM. If we were taking light cuts, we can probably cut it at 1115, but 660 is a little bit better speed for what we're doing. Okay. Bring our cutter down. We're going to lock the quill down and index the cutter just over the edge of the part. We're going to raise the mill bed until we just come in contact with it. Back the cutter away. We're going to take about 50 thousandths at a pass very gently advance the cutter across the part. Okay. Take another pass. Again, listen to the machine. We've got a nice smooth sound as the cutter is working across the part. It's not going clackety clackety clack indicating that we're machining at too high of an RPM or too fast of a feed rate. Okay, when you have a lot of material exposed, as in this case, you want to have a very slow feed rate. We don't want to hob across it really quick, tearing the part from the vise. Okay, we're just about there. And remember, this is kind of a climb operation relative to the top edge of the part. We're removing the burr off in this process. 
index our cutter over, come across it for the second pass. Okay, about another 20,000, so I ought to do it. You can also watch the chip color. You can see the chips are coming off in a nice shiny color. They're not turning straw or blue color, again, indicating too high of an RPM or too fast of a feed rate. We're not using any cutting fluid on this particular job. We're machining a leaded type material that machines really well. Okay, there you have it. We've surfaced that at 30 degrees. Done a real nice job. We've showed you a little different type of material now. That was a piece of steel, 11L17. Nice piece of free machining leaded steel. Got to turn it on the side there, and you can see the angle that we've machined on it. So you can see the versatility of having a couple of vices around and how to mount them in our main vise on the table. Now, let's take a look at indicating in, by the use of the edge finder, our machined block of aluminum for a hole pattern or for a slot. Just another example of how to properly use the edge finder to locate the position of a hole, a slot, or a rail that we may want to machine. All right, it's important again that we clean the vice jaws really well. We've got our nice polished surface block that we worked on a little bit earlier, and we don't want to damage or mar it by having some chips in the vise or chips on the part as we tighten the vise up, embedding the chips in those parts. If you're doing a lot of finish work that's to be anodized, painted, uh, black oxided, it's real important that we treat the exterior finish of the part very gently. The customer really gets ticked off as he's got some really nice ground parts and he sends them to you for a second or third operation to be done and you muck them up by clamping a bunch of drill shavings into the sides of his part, okay? So take your time again. We want to have pride in our work. We want to make sure that everything we do is the best that we can possibly do. We don't take any shortcuts. We don't turn out any shoddy work simply because we've got a hot date that night with Susie Q. Do it the following day. All right, we've secured our part in the vise. We've tightened the vise jaws up. We've pushed down with our fingers, loosened and tightened the vise. Everything feels really solid. We'll go ahead and replace our cutter now with the edge finder, and we'll make some more calculations as if we were going to drill a hole in the top of our part. Always get in the habit of snugging down the edge finder in the collet. Just don't finger tighten it. Okay, we want to get a real true reading now. We'll take our dial calipers. <clears throat> we're going to measure, we're going to cut a slot down the top of this. Just as an example, the width of our part is 1 inch 245 thousandths. So we're going to take and divide that in two. That's going to be 622 and a half thousandths plus the 100 thousandths offset for the edge finder. So our total dimension is, for the price is right, 722 and a half thousandths in order to get our spindle directly over the center of our part. All right, turn the machine on. Don't forget to throw your safety glasses on. I'm gonna bring our edge finder up very gently until we just see the offset. Okay, at that point, we're going to lock down the gib. We're going to come over to our dials again. We're going to loosen the lock ring, re zero our dial. Stay focused on the dial right now. I'm just going to go up and raise the edge finder, and we're going to advance the table in the y axis now 722 thousandths, 200. 400, 600, 700, 10, 22. And as we get up on those half thousands, I like to stop just shy of it and just take my knuckle and tap on the hand wheel to achieve that extra half thousands, okay? If you've got a digital readout, you're simply going to be watching the digital readout at this point until that half thousands clicks up. But using your knuckle, as just a little knocker is another little secret in order to advance the dial carefully.
Turn our machine off. If we were to project our edge finder down, we're in the exact center of that part in order to cut a slot. All right, we've got a more difficult job to tackle now. We've got a headspace gauge. For those of you that are familiar in the firearms industry, this is a headspace gauge for my new handheld personal defense weapon. Only joking. We need to bore this hole out a little bit larger in the center of this part, but wow, how do we find the center of it? We want to make sure that we've located it securely in the vise. We can put an additional V-block clamp or make a V-block clamp in here that holds it securely, but for just to show you how to dial it in, we're simply going to con <coughs> constrain it in the vise here snugly. We'll show you how to find it in a hurry. We've inserted a 3 8 collet in the top. We want to find the center of that hole quickly, so we're going to turn an end mill upside down, lower the quill, in preparation for the final dialing. Okay, so we're going to advance our table, the X and Y axis, and we're just going to eyeball that end mill into the center of our part. Okay, looking left and right, down on the top, and let's see where we're at. Okay, that looks pretty close. Remember how we use the back side of the end mill to help align our vise prior to the dialing in operation. This is basically the same thing. It's a neat little trick that I learned over the years to facilitate rapid mounting and machining of specific parts. Another good way that you can do it, once we've made a location here with our, the end of our end mill, using our eyeball to say, yeah, that's pretty close. We can go ahead and move over on our dial now, loosen our lock nut, re-zero our dial, Tighten the lock ring down now and go from side to side. Let's go ahead and give that a try. We've got 200 thousandths until we just come in contact with the side. Okay, we've got 390 thousandths from that center location. Go back to zero and again we're going to go the other direction now. There's 200 thousandths. Okay, and 180. So just by eyeballing it, I missed it about 10 thousandths, or double the thickness of the hair on your head. So let's go back to center now, where we think it was in the eyeball. We're pretty close, and let's install the dial indicator, and we'll bring it into exact location. We're going to change collets now. We're going to put in our 3 32nd diameter collet. We're going to use a Sterrett last word dial indicator. Anytime that we use the dial indicator, we want to secure it down. Okay, and we can take the dial with our little flipper flip directions here. So now when we come in contact, okay, with our part, we're going to lower it down into the hole, and we're going to take our finger and just advance it over to the side. We're going to preload the dial indicator a little bit, okay, right to around 15. Then we're just going to rotate it by hand and watch the amount of offset. And I like to work it again as we did when we were dealing with uh, tramming in the head on a north-south, east-west direction or the x-axis and the y-axis. Okay, it's just a little bit easier to keep track in our head how much we want to dial in that part. So we'll take a reading here at the south end of things and we've got 12 thousandths. We'll turn it over to the other side and see what we have there. And we're at 13, so we're going to take a thousandths adjustment out there. We'll turn over to this side. We're at 5. And we're at 20 there. So we'll go back to 10. Okay. OK, 
pin again if you're running out of offset go ahead and just preload the indicator again for another 15 20 thousandths so we get plenty of contact as we rotate it around in the hole we've got to have pressure with the dial indicator in order to get an accurate reading okay we're just looking at the dial again in the north south east west direction we're making the adjustments with the travel dials on the mill to where that needle in rotation stays in the same location or within whatever tolerance we decide is appropriate for the task at hand. Okay, we're within about a half a thousandth now on that hole. So we rotate it all the way around. So now we're ready for that boring operation. Our hole that we would bore would be concentric to our existing hole within about a half a thousandths, which for this intended job is pretty doggone close. Now we're going to step up to a little higher tech tool and one that I strongly recommend you purchase called a Blake coaxial indicator. You saw approximately how long it took us to dial this in. We showed you a couple of tricks by using the end mill inverted in the collet to roughly eyeball it in. Now watch how quickly it takes to bring into play with a coax indicator. Now lower the bed a little bit. We can get our coax indicator in place. Raise the quill. Remove our existing indicator. And replace it with a 3 8 collet. All right, this is an example of our Blake coax indicator, really a slick little product. I wish I had invented this. We've got different feeler points that we can use depending upon dialing in the inside or outside of a hole. This portion you see goes into the, our 3 8 collet, and this is a little hold bar to hold it firmly in place while we turn the machine on and make the necessary adjustments while the machine is running. Watch how quick and slick this particular product is. Insert it into the collet. Again, tighten it down. We don't want it falling out during the dialing in process. And we're simply going to lower the quill. There are necessary adjustments. We can spring our, tweak our adjustment out here just a little bit to preload the dial. Okay, we're going to shift the gear or shift the machine into back gear at this point. We want the indicator turning really slow. We don't want to turn it on at 5,000 RPM and burn the bearings out in it, okay? So we're going to shift into back gear. We're going to turn it at about 80 RPM at this stage of the game. Grab your safety glasses and watch how slick a coax indicator is in operation. <laughs> All right, if we take a look, we can see that we had our original dial with the stare at last word. It ended about a half thousandths. Now, watch how quick and easy it is with the coax indicator. We're going to move the y-axis out. We can see our needle dial is just going nuts right now. Watch how easy it is to pull it back into spec. Simply turn it until that needle just about comes to a stop. All right, if we go too far the other direction, again, the needle starts to go nuts. So it's really fast and easy to bring it back into play very slowly and precisely until all needle movement stops. Now let's do it on the x-axis and you can see what happens. Right, needle's going nuts. We'll bring it back into play. Okay, and there we are within about one ten thousandths of an inch of being perfectly dialed in above the bore in this specific part. The coax indicator, in my opinion, is one of the most useful tools that you can buy if you're going to be doing a lot of dial indicating work, either on interior or exterior diameter parts. All right, we've reviewed a lot of the techniques and how to properly set up the workpiece, how to use the edge finder, how to square a block of material, remember to remove the burrs, remember the trick with the WD-40 on the parallels. That sucks them up against the vice jaws, keeps the dirt and debris out from behind them, keeps them from shifting as we remove the workpiece 
to interchange it with another one. We showed you how the coax indicator works. We showed you some different methods that allow you to make the ideal setup. Keep in mind rigidity is very important. Keep in mind that the amount of cutter protruding from the collet is again very important. We cannot gain in one area and lose in another. We have to work together. We have to have a good solid work support. We have to have the cutter mounted rigidly in the collet, in the tool holder, or in the chuck. Remember, when you're using an edge finder, edge finder diameters, nine out of ten of them are going to be two hundred thousandths in diameter. When we come up against the workpiece, we want to add an additional hundred thousandths to whatever the half dimension is in order to bring the spindle and quill directly to the center line of that existing part. All right, that's pretty well a wrap on setups. Now let's move on to our next phase.